let's have a lesson and discussion on this piece. Uh, follow the lesson for free and just pick up all the tips for free from the video. But if you're interested, I do have a sheet music edition of all 25 etudes in Carcassi's Opus 60. And there's a link for that in the description. So um, etude number two brings us really into the kind of uh, etudes that are in Opus 60 and that teachers um, often assign to their students a lot because from a pedagogical standpoint, they're very clear. So for example, in this piece, you have an arpeggio pattern with some repeated notes and he consistently keeps that texture pretty much from start to finish with the exception of like some phrase endings here and there. So uh, a, like many of the etudes in Opus 60, this is a great opportunity to either um, develop a skill or to bring that skill to a high level. So sometimes um, when I'm assigning this piece, you know, the tempo will be very slow. You know, and we might be working on the arpeggio and the exchange of the, of the single notes, as well as the chord changes. But then, you know, if the student is a little bit more at the intermediate or, or late intermediate level, then we're going to really raise that tempo and which offers uh, much more of a, not just development, but a honing in and, and refinement of, of a skill. So great etude, um, like many of the etudes in Opus 60. The right hand fingering that I've chosen for this particular etude is maybe considered a modern fingering, but I think it's what everyone everyone does now. Um, P I M A M A M A. There's a lot of options though that you could use on those repeated notes. I use M A because I think that you end up with that A finger there, and then it's just it's a really good opportunity to develop. Um, rapid alternation of those two fingers. And in general, um, students and, and people, uh, players, these two fingers are a little bit more efficient at that than these two fingers. So it's a really great opportunity. It is an etude, so we can develop that. There's other options. I even put in brackets in my edition that you could use MI. But, but I think that using MA is better. Um, there is like three finger combos you could go P I M A M I M A. That's also very, very interesting. Uh, but nevertheless, I chose to use M A uh, to, to work on that skill, and that's what I would assign my students as well. And then that's consistent through the entire piece. Now, the other thing I would, I would mention in terms of like uh, the way I would teach this piece before we start talking about phrasing and the dynamics is that I would, I would recommend probably that students practice it in block chords, you know, taking the half note notes and forming a chord. Sorry. Getting to know those chord shapes really well so your hand knows the overall chord shape. But then the next step would be uh, much more practical is play the bass note first and then get the chord. So bass, chord, 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 bass, chord. And the reason we do that is that when you're playing the piece to actually connect one chord shape to the next, it's going to be very essential that you, you grab the next bass note first. Now, a lot of the bass notes are open strings, so that makes it very easy. But in some of the cases, that's not true. It's a fretted note. So if we look at the exchange from bar five, measure five to measure six, tried to get that with block shapes you're gonna to have to move very quickly to cover up the gap in sound when you release one set of one set of notes and try to get the next so instead by grabbing the bass note first bass then the chord bass then the chord so it's like bang bang or even at fast tempos it might even be one finger at a time da, 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 da. 
um, in order to be legato from, from one to the next. So if you're trying to play this piece by jumping the chord shapes around, that's probably, it's, that can be very a very good practice method to learn the overall shapes in the left hand. But in terms of legato progression through the chords, uh, you're going to want to get that next bass note. And then either the rest of the chord after that or one note at a time in order to, to connect the sound as, as much as possible. And then you can practice that through the whole piece. So that's those are two um, very like technical oriented um, pieces of advice for the piece. Now, in terms of the um, musicality of the piece, you know, it says moderato with expression. Um, I, so not, you know, I, I have seen people play it super, super fast, um, but sometimes, you know, the, sometimes the faster you go, expression can be a little bit difficult. So I, I would definitely take like a, a, a quick tempo, but not so much that you can't shape a little bit. And... I do tend to um, crescendo and then I try to back off on the last two notes. Just so that it, it feels like, you know, a little wave and it feels like a, a little bit more musical, not just, not too blunt because when you have a repetitive pattern um, over and over from start to finish in this era of music, um, I find that just adding to that little bit of shaping really um, helps it quite a bit from from not so it's not too jarring. But there are overall dynamics as well, and you know I will say that some editions don't include Carcassi's original dynamics. I have in my edition, so they're all Carcassi's from the first publication. But I will be honest that sometimes I don't like his dynamics. I think that what you can do is you can look at his dynamics as a... If you take the microscope back and you look at the first dynamic and the last of the section and then just some of the crescendos and decrescendos, um, I think those are generally good and you can form like a blueprint for the piece. But in terms of following like every single dynamic mark he, he has, I would say you can... You can have some flexibility with what you do with the dynamics there. Um, especially when he's throwing in some of these sforzandos and going right to pianos and then back to sforzandos. Uh, I find it's a little... It, sometimes it's really good and can be very exciting and effective, so I encourage you to explore it and to do it. But at the same time, um, yes, explore it, but then if you if you disagree, you can you can tweak it a little bit. So let's just do a walkthrough of the piece now and we'll we'll just talk about some of the things that come up. There shouldn't be too much. The piece is actually pretty straightforward. A couple of fingerings that I'll, I'll discuss though. So I use three here so that I can hold the bar here. Then I shift down with the third finger, so the third finger is a guide. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now, this one I do switch to two. Because if I use if I use two on the top, I'm gonna have to jump it to the bass note of the next chord within a time frame of a sixteenth note. So if I start again from measure three. That second finger just slightly early to grab that next bass note because you don't want there to be too much of a gap there it just allows you to grab that E a little bit easier and then carrying on from measure five just get those bass notes first Yeah, like that piano in at the end of measure six, I don't really follow it because I just like keeping the energy up a little bit and then you can relax a little bit there. 
So overall, I'm following his, his plan for dynamics, but not every specific one. Second half is measure nine. I like all of his crescendo markings usually. I don't know about that sforzando there just because I like doing his crescendo. some of these I'm, I'm not doing a bar that's just because when it when you have a bass note afterwards the bar can can make a tricky shift so I'll use two three four so I can grab the next bass note more easily so that's one place where the arpeggio span from the right hand is a little bit different grabbing that G sharp on the on the fourth string So again, measure 16. The transition works really nicely. 17. This is the same as the beginning. I keep my third finger down here. So when I play those final notes, I often mute out the rest of the notes just to get that clear final note. So in many ways, very straightforward piece. Um, you know, even late beginners can kind of learn it as long as they have at least a little bit of bar practice. Um, but to do it efficiently and to do it faster and to do it with, with you know, some amount of, of speed and grace, uh, it, it can be quite challenging and it's a great workout. I worked it with the metronome a lot, bringing it way past the tempo of performance, like 10 clicks higher on the metronome than I would ever perform it, just to really work my technique and to get those fingers working. And then I just backed off the, I turned the metronome off, backed off the tempo and, and, and just played the piece a little bit more musically. So I, I recommend that you do the same thing so that you get lots of technical benefit from the piece, but you also explore the more expressive side because he does say it's, it's moderato con espressivo. Um, so, you know, moderate tempo with expression. And uh, yeah, one of those great etudes from Opus 60 that um, very clear in its intention and very clear for students to study and enjoy. <laughs>